So guys, now we are into the next part of the lecture, which is basically the multivariate linear regression. So as of now, what we were doing was basically trying to plot y versus x, and we were trying to plot a straight line between y versus x, and the whole understanding was that that line is supposed to be such that the deviation of the target from the prediction should be minimum. The same concept applies here as well in multivariate linear regression. Now, instead of a line, it's gonna be a plane if you are considering two variables two independent variables that is if you're considering more than two then it's gonna be something which is a hyperplane and obviously now it's basically a straight line but now it's gonna be in 2d 3d 4d 5d or 6d and so on and so forth right so if you have a 35 independent features you would basically have 35d plane right 35d straight line so that is basically a 35 dimensional plane but at the end of the day it's basically a straight line linear relationship that you're trying to plot so that's about it just absolutely that's it there's nothing more or less here so there's just the only change that is happening is uh, earlier we were basically using one variable now we would have multiple variables and also so just to kind of make sure that you understand this uh, earlier my y prediction was this right y prediction was theta naught plus theta one x right now there's now there's that not anymore x but there is x1 x2 x3 and so on and so forth so now my y prediction is theta 1 x1 plus theta 2 x2 plus theta 3 x3 and so on and so forth right so if i have 30 50 features to all the way till theta 50 x50 right so that's the idea that we have here so now anymore now the only thing is as i was saying this is basically an equation of a multi-dimension 50 dimensional plane you cannot anymore plot y and x right because there's no x single x here there's x1 x2 x3 so there's 50 different x's so you can always plot y versus x1 y versus x2 and 50 different plots but if you want to plot y and all of the x's together you cannot plot in one two dimensional figure like this right so this is not possible out here so that's it just the visualization part is something that is going to be a bit more challenging you cannot actually visualize the Earlier, you could very well visualize how the line was looking like. In this case, in multivariate linear regression, that's the only thing that is going to get go for a toss. But apart from that, the rest of the thing is absolutely simple, like we have explained. You're just going to, it's just well, the same thing, right? You're going to have 50 different, the gradient descent, you're going to do 50 times over. That's it, right? So nothing, nothing which is very different uh, from the rest of the things. So how you do that in Eskelon is something you first read the data then you just say all the variables except for the last variable because your last column is your sales price. So everything is your X. So let's look at the data, right? So data looks like this. So you have your all your data frame. This is your entire data frame. Now this is your Y and this is your X. So you say everything apart from the last column is your X. Everything only in the last column is your Y, right? And then you just do the same thing that we have explained. So you do linear regression, you call that class you instantiate that and once you instantiate then you just see dot fit x comma y uh, that's about it so if you do print regression uh, you basically so now if you want to predict the house price of a house which is say that in this case the 150th row number house right so if you want to predict the house of that particular price you can directly do my house and then you can just do pred regressor dot predict and you can pass the house features right so and you will get the corresponding predicted value of that house so that's about it that's as simple as, as it is right so it's nothing different nothing absolutely changed here right so you had basically everything that was earlier there which is your x values and y values and you basically instead of now one single value of x you have multiple values of x the rest of it in scalar and as well as in real theory is absolutely same right which is basically you instead of having just one single equation for calculating uh, you earlier had two equations right theta one for theta naught and one for theta one and you solve those two equations and an alternative to solving linear equation was the idea of using gradient descent so using whatever you did there was just a small number of equations to be solved in that case in this case there are a lot more complexity that is there in, involved but apart from that number of equations being solved being higher that's about it the basic concept is same now instead of y being equals to theta naught plus theta 1x it's y prediction equals to theta naught plus theta 1x plus theta 2x and so on and so forth 
and uh, once you kind of your whole job of the machine learning algorithm is now to come up with the best possible theta not theta 1 theta 2 so on theta 50 50 such parameters such that uh, for that given particular value of theta naughts your deviation of your line from your target values of your predictions or target value and prediction is basically minimized and that's exactly something that we have been able to do out here so conceptually it's absolutely the same thing there's nothing more that we are doing here right and now we are trying to predict the prices for all the houses in the data set we just do regressor dot predict and then pass all the features right of our pre uh, which is our x bus basically the independent features right so regressor dot predict you pass the independent features and you get the prediction of the houses so now let's see how good a job we have done so now let's try and see the measuring the goodness of it So to measure the goodness of fit, so we are basically going to try and measure the same way we have already measured our algorithm, right? Which is uh, the error function that we have used earlier. We are going to try and use the same thing, which is a mean squared error, right? So earlier, the, the way we calculated how well our model was performing was using y prediction minus y target, right? And square of that. So the same measure we are going to try and use to measure, see how good our model is performing so that's the same thing that we have used so that's you can just do the mean squared error so there's one small thing so squared error is this thing and this is there are, there are, you can basically get this squared error for all the data points in the series right instead of getting all the data points in a series you basically average them out right so sum them up and divide them by total and then you get the mean squared error so mean of all the squared errors right so that's why it's called mean squared error so once you do that, that's the metric that we use to measure how good our line is. And that's about it. So obviously one thing that you would probably see is that uh, the, the, the error value seems to be very high, right? Which is basically the reason because of which, with the reason because of which the error value is very high is that your prices are extremely high value range, right? 225,000, 300,000, 350,000. So if you are making an error even of 1% in those cases, uh, in actual absolute terms, the value is quite high, right? So that's why you can see that when you're measuring this error and you're kind of summing that up and averaging that, even though you're making an error of say 50,000, right? Which is not a very huge amount in front of say, or you're probably making an error of 5,000, right? Uh, so, but if you're squaring that error of 5,000 and it suddenly becomes a huge number, right? So that, that's a problem in kind of, even if you're making 225,000, you're predicting as 220,000, that seems like close enough, but the error is basically 5,000. And when you square that 5,000, that becomes 25 million. So that's why this is prob this is a problem that is coming up right now. So average error seems to be very high, which is because the thing that you're measuring is already in a high dimension. So there are some small assumptions that we kind of want to kind of now understand before we kind of get into the rest of the uh, linear regression related stuff which is the last part of the session actually so assumptions of linear regression uh, where we are going to talk about what are the different underlying assumptions that uh, that are necessary to be kind of met for you to kind of go ahead and make sure that linear regression works so now coming back to assumptions in linear regression as I said there is key assumptions that goes behind uh, linear regression now one thing to keep in mind is these are assumptions. Uh, if they get violated, uh, what does it mean? What does it mean if assumption gets violated? It doesn't mean that you cannot fit a linear regression model. It just says that the linear regression that you're going to fit is not probably the optimum thing to fit. You could probably go better with some other models that you can probably think of. Uh, but that's about it. It's, it doesn't say anything that, you know, if your assumption in linear regression model is something that is violated, you probably cannot fit a linear regression. No, it's not about that. It just says that what are the conditions uh, for your linear regression models to perform the best, right? So if those conditions are met, you would basically linear regression is the most optimum, most most optimum algorithm that you can use to fit it, right? So let's go ahead, kind of go ahead and figure out what those assumptions are and how we can validate them. So first assumption is a uh, linear relationship assumption, which is basically that the relationship between response and the feature variables should be linear, right? Now, this is something that I want to kind of talk about for a bit right now, which is that uh, what does linear regression or mean, right? Uh, that's something that we need to kind of understand. So 
So this assumption says that if your first assumption of your linear regression is that there's there's a linear relationship between your variables, right? The independent variable that you're trying to measure and the dependent so the dependent variable you're trying to predict and the independent features that you have uh, they are linearly related. Now linearly does it mean that it always needs to be a straight line? Uh, frankly no. So now let's go into the assumptions of linear regression. The first one is linear relationship assumption which says that relationship between your dependent features and your independent target should basically be linear. Now let's try and first understand what does a linear relationship even mean right? So does it mean that it needs to be a straight line relationship always? So this is an independent, this is an independent variable and this is an independent feature and you're assuming that there's a linear relationship. So linear relationship, does it mean that it always needs to be, uh, you know, if, if linear relationship means that they're always, this will be a straight line relationship, does this qualify to be a linear relationship or not, right? So this, is y and this is x so there's a par parametric a curve parabola curve kind of an equation that you have between them so does this does this kind of uh, qualify to be a linear relationship the answer probably most of you would have guessed wrong is that yes this does qualify to be a linear relationship now what does linear then mean right because we thought linear always meant was basically straight line relationship now if you go back through the videos and you kind of look back what I said, I never said that there's a straight line. I said always there's a linear relationship. Now what does linear relationship mean that we are saying y naught equals to theta naught plus theta 1 x1 in case of say this particular case. So there's just 1 x. So let's not call it x1. Let's just say theta 1 theta 1 x. So in this case linear basically is in terms of parameters, right? So if it's is it linear in terms of parameters, that's a question you need to understand. If your assumption is this theta 1 into x square that is still linear because this is theta naught plus theta 1 in terms of theta naught and theta 1 that is linear right but say for example if you had something like theta naught plus theta 1 square into x1 now this is not linear right because this is not linear in terms of your parameters now in case of x you could have x log x anything as long as this is not this is linear right in terms of this is straight line relationship between in the parameters I'm not talking about the variable. The variable could be log x, it could be e to the power x, it could be anything. It doesn't matter. As long as there's a linear relationship in terms of parameters, right? Uh, that's when you would tend to call it a linear uh, regression, right? So that's the thing that you want to kind of understand very clearly. So even if you're doing this thing, right? So if you're trying to y equals to y equals to theta naught plus uh, theta one into, I don't know, e to the power log x e to the power square root of x say you know and that is still a linear regression because it's linear in terms of theta and theta 1 right theta naught and theta 1 so that's the thing so linear relationship assumption is something that is extremely important now linear relationship can be tested using scatter plots so obviously in this particular case uh, there's something wrong though here in this slide which is basically the fact that this is a linear relationship and this is also a linear relation. The very fact that it could be represented using a curve like this is probably something that says that there might be a linear relationship. So the next part is, uh, next assumption in linear regression is that fact that little or no multicollinearity assumption, which is basically the assumption that there is, what is multicollinearity? Multicollinearity is the fact that if there are, if your independent features are within themselves, linear, within themselves related with each other, right? So then that is called collinearity in your data, right? Multicollinearity. So it results in unstable parameter estimates, which makes it very difficult to assess the effect of independent variables. So the very fact that the variables that you're calling independent are not actually independent. They are basically one of those are basically dependent on some other things, on some of the other independent features, right? So say you have 50 features. Now of those 50 features, there are probably five features which are dependent on the rest 45 features. So that's those five features. If they are present in your data, you're not a linear regression is not going to work very well, right? So that's why it's important you drop those five columns, five features which are related to the other columns, right? So you just go ahead with 45 features and not the 50 features because your five features are linearly dependent on your 45 features. So how do you do that? You basically can do pair plots to kind of come with the same thing, right? So pair plot is basically instead of 
so you can basically plot the scatter plot the same way you try to detect if there's a linear dependency of y and x you can plot x1 and x2 and then x1 and x3 and so on and so forth or you can basically calculate correlation between all of them use some way to basically measure if there's if there's a strong dependency of uh, any of the pairs of variables right because if there's a strong dependency of any of the pairs of variable probably that means uh, one of them is strongly correlated with the other one so that's that's a that's a that's a thing that you need to keep in mind that if you're having uh, if you're having uh, features which are related to which are not actually independent which are basically dependent on other uh, independent features then probably it's a better idea to remove those features before you go into uh, before you go into model building so the next assumption is this fact that homocedasticity assumption what does homocedasticity says homocedasticity is a very complex word let's first acknowledge that now what is homocedasticity? It's not as complex as the word itself is. It basically describes the situation in which the error term, which is basically the error term, we already know what is the error term, is same across all the values of independent variables, right? Similar, I would not want to use the word same. What it basically means is that this particular value, this the error that you're measuring, right? So you have different values that you have here, right? And then you have a straight line that passes through. Now this error, the deviation that you are measuring, that should be basically be same across even if your x values are increasing, right? So if your if your error basically say this are your error terms, right? And your this is a y versus x. And now instead of y versus x, you plot error and you plot x, right? So this is your error and this is your x. Now you plot that you would see that if your error should basically be somewhere around zero, right? So they should normally be distributed as zero. The only thing that homocedasticity says it does not it does not uh, imply that they should be nearly zero. But whatever value they should be, this value should suddenly not increase as the value of x increases, right? So even if at a higher value of x, the error should not be higher, right? So that's all the homocedasticity uh, implies. So if your error, if your as your x values kind of increase, the error should basically be almost as similar, right, across all different values of x. So generally, non-constant variance arises in presence of outliers or extreme large values. So if you have extremely outlier values in your data set, that probably it's a good idea to remove them before you go into model building for linear regression. Because if you have extreme models, extreme values, they might tend to uh, flout the homocedasticity uh, assumption of linear regression. Uh, so how to validate you can always plot the dependable variable versus uh, so this is what I'm saying right so if you plot the error versus the dependent independent variable you can very easily see that it uh, whether or not it values it uh, satisfied the homocedasticity condition or not in this plot we can see that the variance around linear regression is nearly the same and hence it satisfies as you can see the error values are almost in the same zone right remember this we are plotting y versus x so the error values are basically something which is around uh, the deviation of the straight line from which you cannot see in this case so in this particular case uh, the variance plot of the regression line is same for all values of predictor variables so which basically makes sense uh, and that homocedasticity kind of holds in this case yeah, now the fourth assumption of uh, linear regression which is that there should be little or no quote, autocorrelation in the residual. What does autocorrelation mean? Autocorrelation is a simple concept which basically says that if a variable is related to itself, right? So if there's a if there's a value like this, right? So if your values are like in a form like this, right? So you basically see that every time there's, there's the series there's a particular pattern in this data set, right? So what does this assumption linear regression say is that your error if you plot across independent values so this is error and these are independent values right so there should not be any particular pattern to that right so there should not be something like this your error and your independent variables should not have a pattern which is probably very easy to figure out right as in there should not be basically any not it's not about easy to figure out part it's basically there should not be any pattern so if you have no pattern then the autocorrelation of that data should basically be so basically it should be randomly distributed and there should not be any particular pattern in the distribution of error and independent variables right so that's the concept behind no autocorrelation 
uh, or little or no auto correlation, right? So the error terms are basically completely independent, which basically makes sense, right? Your error should not be if, the, if basically if, the, if there's a pattern to your error, that means there's some more pattern that needs to be captured out of the data, and you have not captured the entire pattern out of the data because if you have captured the entire pattern out of the data, the remaining part of it should just be random noise. So the noise plot should basically just kind of look very random, right? So there's no reason for there to be any pattern existing in the error versus independent variable. So this is the same thing that I'm saying, right? So in the left case, you can see that there are correlated errors. This is a true trend. That is a line that you have predicted and you can see that the errors are basically something that there's a, there's a pattern to the errors, right? Whereas in the right side example, you can clearly see that in there's not really much of a pattern that is there in case of the data set so that's something that you need to be kind of be careful about when you're plotting now again all of this might sound very theoretical and the actual understanding that you need to take away from all of this is that uh, obviously you cannot see plots right you cannot see error plots until and unless you have done the linear regression model so basically thinking about all of this kind of it, it's contrary it's uh is counterproductive in before you kind of go into model building right so before before you go into model building if you start thinking oh hey i think i have auto correlated features obviously if you have features auto correlated you can remove them but you would not know actually if you have auto correlated errors or not until and unless you actually have the first linear regression model right so these are assumptions of linear regression these are theories behind linear regression which you need to understand uh, which is probably helpful, but at the end of the day, this is not something that stops you from making a linear regression model, right? It just probably, if there's an auto correlated error, that just means that there's a lot more uh, pattern that needs to be captured, right? That's about it. So it just says that there's a better model possible and the thing that we have is not the best. But that's about it. It just says it's, it's not the best, it's not the most optimum. Uh, that's it. But that doesn't say that it, it, it's not the it, you cannot apply linear regression in those cases right so next is the normal distribution of error terms so what does it say is, is that uh, in case your norm your error distribution of your norm your basically the errors should be basically distributed normally right which basically which basically is the underlying assumption that your norm these are your errors right so these are different if you have plotted a straight line so this is your y and this is your x and there are multiple values in between and you plot a straight line through them and you calculate the deviation so y minus y prediction minus y and this is the error right so this error basically should be deviated normally right so uh, there should there, the error should basically follow something like that there should be a lot of errors uh, there should be a lot of small errors, sorry, very minimal of small errors. There should be a lot of errors which are around the middle zone and then there should be the high error should again be low, right? So these are your error values and the frequency distribution and this should look like something like this. So there are a lot of errors which are say in the middle value and then which is around zero, right? So the, this is negative. And then there should be a lot of negative values, negative errors which are highly negative those values should be basically extremely low in frequency so as the error which are extremely high in frequency and positive right so very high errors but positive errors and very high negative errors should be low in frequency most of the errors should be basically be around zero right so most of the errors should basically lie within a very small neighborhood of zero and as your errors should go down as, as your error increases the frequency of those errors should kind of go down that's what this particular final assumption of normal distribution of error term says. So that's what you can see in this particular graph as well. Log on to Grey Atoms learning platform to unlock more free content. Subscribe to our channel and hit the bell icon for regular updates.